Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I'm delighted to be joined by Father Thomas Morrow, who has an STL in Moral Theology from the Dominican House of Studies and received his doctorate in Sacred Theology from the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family. Father Morrow has appeared as a guest on numerous Catholic media platforms and is the author of Overcoming Sinful Anger, How to Master Your Emotions and Bring Peace to Your Life, and Overcoming Sinful Thoughts, How to Realign Your Thinking and Defeat Harmful Ideas. With Father Thomas Morrow, we go inside the pages of Straight to Heaven, A Practical Guide for Growing in Holiness, published by Sophia Institute Press. Father Morrow, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, my pleasure. It was such a delight to get a copy of the book. I just love your writing. You have, have been on the forefront of evangelization and teaching the Catholic faith for so long. This is such a great book, and we need it today, Straight to Heaven, A Practical Guide for Growing in Holiness. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. It's so important, don't you think, that not only to grow in holiness, but to know why we're growing in holiness, where we're going, what's the goal. And you set that out right in the very beginning, don't you? This is how I motivated kids in school when I taught in this school, is to teach them about heaven, hell, and purgatory. And once I taught them about that, they listened the whole year. For many people in today's culture anyway, we all believe in heaven, that there's going to be a heaven. We're not so sure about hell. And for many of us, we have no idea what purgatory is. That's right. When you talk about heaven, which I kind of like, you start out right off the bat about what it's going to be like. What are some of those basics that you would want to communicate to someone about why heaven's worth it? So our Lord speaks of uh, a heaven like finding a, a buried treasure, and it's worth selling all you have in order to have it. And it's also like a marriage with God, and we don't talk about that enough, I don't think. The fact that it's going to be like a beautiful marriage with a, a beautiful spouse who is so good and so holy and, and makes us so happy. St. Therese said, I formed such a lofty idea of heaven that at times I wonder what, what God will do on my, my death to surprise me because your hope is so great. So John of the Cross wrote beautifully about the marriage in heaven. He's a wonderful romantic and St. Teresa of Avila wrote that the Lord appeared to her in 1572 and said, from now on, you will be my bride. Till now, you are not married in this, but from now on, not only will you, after my honor as that of your creator and king of God, but as my true bride. So there's plenty of evidence in Scripture that we'll be married to God. Isaiah 62, you shall be called my delight. The Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. Or as a young man marries a virgin, your social, your God marry you. As the bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So there's plenty of evidence in Scripture that we're going to be married to God. But I don't think people talk about, think enough about that, that he wants us this, this intimate and this intimate relationship, which is so beautiful and so delightful that we forget that uh, because... Perhaps we priests don't talk enough about it. I was really struck when I was reading your book, Father, that in this imagery of the divine marriage and having that connection to heaven, I can't think of anything more wonderful than to be in union in love. Because as St. John says, God is love. And so in that divine marriage, it's a sharing of love and that in itself, wouldn't that be the best place to be for all of eternity? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the nice thing about heaven is that there's no time there. Everything is compressed into the present. So everything's happening at once. You don't have to wait for anything. You don't have to keep anything. You don't have to repair anything. Everything is right there, and it's everything is happening at once. 
But a lot of things are happening. It's not to say that they're not happening. They're happening in an instant. St. Paul told us, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. It's hard for us to fathom it, isn't it? Yeah, I think we come up with our own ideas. Sometimes we think from our own vantage point that if I go to heaven, I'll have the riches. I'll have the nicest house. I'll have the nicest car. Everything will be happy. And it's so much deeper than surface items, isn't it? Absolutely. That's true. I mean, we'll have all these things in a sense, but we'll have something better. We'll have beautiful, beautiful relationships with wonderful, wonderful people, and especially God. Yes, we want heaven in a very real way, but we don't really want to discuss hell, do we? The reality of that is a real possibility if that's what we're going to choose. That's right. People, are, uh, they have a tendency to shy away from that, whereas uh, that's very strongly mentioned in the Scripture. And that's when we get in trouble, when we forget about the Scripture and we start coming up with our own ideas. You can't get around that. It is mentioned by our blessed Lord, isn't it? Yeah, between 25 and 30 times in the sacred Scripture. He does mention heaven about 170 times, so the emphasis is on the positive, but it does not lead out, leave out the negative. That's, I think, so confusing for some because when we talk about the negative, it's a loving warning, isn't it? Because ultimately, isn't it true, Father, that if we end up in hell, we've chosen that. Everything has kind of set our hearts towards that. Yes, yes. And uh, in a sense, we choose hell because we refuse the, the riches that God has offered us in being with him forever. And uh, so uh, the problem is, the reason there's a hell is because we have freedom. And freedom is a good thing, but it's not an absolute good. It's an instrumental good. We can use it for the wrong thing. And so if we use it for the wrong thing, we get we get in trouble. We use our freedom to not love God and not love our neighbor. Well, then we have to suffer the consequences. But the only way that there can be a hell is because there's freedom. And we have a choice. And we have to make the right choices. It's a reality that I'm glad you brought forward the doctors of the church, whether it be Bernard of Clairvaux or Teresa of Avila. And you have an extensive quote from St. Francis de Sales. And these are extraordinary saints who give us a very important warning. Absolutely. Absolutely. St. Francis de Sales has a whole chapter in the introduction to the devout life on hell. And Ignatius of Loyola also have a large section in his spiritual exercises about how. You brought up the word suffering. Whatever the, the great mystery of it is, that suffering is an element in all of this, even here on earth, we suffer here on earth, don't we? Yeah. Can't get around it. Yeah, and the solution to that is, our, is the crucifix. Jesus suffered because of sin, and St. Peter said, Christ suffered for you and left you an example that you should follow in his steps. So we have to share in that redemptive work, not nearly to the extent that Jesus did, but to some extent, yeah, we have to make up for, help make up for sins of the world. Maybe not our sins, but maybe our sins too. But uh, all the sins of the world have to be made up uh, because God is so good, he's committed to justice. He is, and I think that's one of the reasons, isn't it, that not only the justice, but also his great mercy, that we would have the opportunity in what is still very much a dogma of the Church, is purgatory, the existence of that existence and where Christ helps us to heal. But it also involves the suffering because of the choices that we made here on earth. Yes, atonement. We, we, we have to make atonement. Jesus took on most of the atonement for sin. We have a relatively small amount to make up in purgatory, which is very, very arduous. And people that say they just want to go to purgatory are really very mistaken because it's not the kind of place you want to go to. It's painful. The section that you have of Thomas Aquinas' teaching on that even now in our own lifetime, haven't you experienced this, Father, particularly with penitents that you might have spoken to, where they're a realization of the pain that you caused another 
or the experience of pain that because of other people's choices on the, on the soul, it causes um, emotionally such an agony. Imagine that when you don't even have the body to in the senses, that it's just sheer the soul coming to an awareness of the of the pain that it's inflicted on others. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that Jesus said, you must love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself. If there weren't a purgatory, what would be out, what would be say about people that love God a good amount and uh, the neighbor a great amount, but didn't live with all our heart, soul, and mind? We either have to contradict God or we have to deny, you know, that, that there is a purgatory. You can't do that. God must be respected in everything he said, everything Jesus said. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking with Father Thomas Morrow, the author of Straight to Heaven, A Practical Guide for Growing in Holiness. You really give us those steps. Why wait and begin now? There are elements of heaven that can be experienced in our quest to grow in that holiness, isn't there? Absolutely. People have a taste of heaven on earth. They also have a taste of of purgatory on earth. And so this should help us realize what we're hoping for. We're hoping for this wonderful, magnificent relationship with God and and all his pe- holy people in heaven. If we experience that on earth and know how special that is, we are aspiring with all our hearts to strive to do what our Lord said, to be worthy of entering the kingdom. Uh, if we're going to be those followers of Christ, if we're going to take his instruction, he gave us many things that we need to align ourselves with and get ourselves ready, but there were two great commandments, and it's to love God with all our heart and all our soul and to love our neighbor. I think that is really key. Sometimes it's easier to love the guy across the street than it is to take care of our own family members. That's the heart of the gospel, those two great commandments. That's the heart of all of Scripture. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. But isn't that hard today, even in social media, Father? I mean, I don't, I don't know if you dive into it at all or experience it at all, but you can have very good, holy Christians, very holy Catholic Christians 
who will get on a, a Facebook page or somewhere else and Boy, the things that they can write about others. I don't know about you, but as far as I know, detraction is even still a sin, isn't it? Yeah. Luckily, I don't experience much of that. But yeah, among the uh, general population, yeah, there's a lot of that. And we got to realize that we have to love not only our friends, but our enemies as well. We don't have to like them, but we have to love them. And praying for them, too. I mean, that's an act of love even to ask God to have mercy on them and on ourselves. That's an important action, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have to uh, remember those. And that's one of the spiritual works of mercy, pray for the living and the dead. But this is where it really hits the road for many people. It's just, how do I pray? What I love about the book is that in in this entrance into holiness is that that's how you start it all off. It's not so much the actions, but first the communion in prayer, as it were, that communication, and realizing that it's God who's calling us, it's us who are responding to him with that prayer. Starting out with prayer is an important thing for people to begin this growth in holiness. Everybody has to start somewhere. I do recommend to parents that they provide incentives for their children to start praying. And the reason is this, you can't keep giving incentive to your children forever on prayer. But what happens is once they experience prayer and realize that it's not so bad and God gives consolations to people when they start praying, that when the time comes and and they really need the prayer, they know how to do it and they know that it works. So it's important for parents to provide all kinds of incentives to their children so they will start to pray. And I used to, and, and uh, when I taught in the school, I would offer uh, rewards for the kids if they would pray five minutes a day for a whole month. And I noticed that the third graders did a lot better than the seventh graders. <laughs> hmm. So, of course, I had to up the uh, incentives for the seventh graders. I had to offer them pizza for the whole class. Some graders finally got it, but sometimes it was difficult for them. As you point out, Father Morrow, in Straight to Heaven, A Practical Guide for Growing in Holiness, there are different methods of prayer. As we grow in prayer, sometimes our conversations with God changes, whether it's the vocal prayer or maybe we'll enter into meditation, contemplation. It's what it looks like it can be praying the rosary. It can be entering into stations of the cross. Praying the rosary is one of the most important types of prayer because it's meditation. And the saints have written so beautifully about the rosary. John Paul II said it was his his favorite prayer. St. Francis Sales said the best way to pray is to pray the rosary. So it's a wonderful way if you do it right, if you meditate on the mysteries. If you just string together a whole bunch of Hail Marys, that's not the rosary. Pope Paul VI said the rosary without the meditations is like a body without a soul. So it's so important that we, that we work on this prayer. And this is the prayer that Our Lady gave us at Fatima. She reminded us that she wanted five mysteries of the rosary every day for world peace. And today, we need to pray harder than ever for world peace because of what's going on. And it takes a commitment, doesn't it? Yeah, you have to make a commitment. If you just say, well, I'm going to pray when I can or I pray when I feel like it, That's like telling God, well, if I have time, I'll pray to you. But if not, uh, I'm going to leave you out. That's not a good relationship. That's not good enough for God. He wants us to make a commitment and fulfill our commitment every day uh, without fail. So we need to make it a priority. That's how we make God first. Not by praying uh, three hours a day, which would be good, but by committing to pray a certain amount of, uh, every day, starting with a small amount, maybe five, 10 minutes, whatever, and then every year growing in that. That's how we get to the point where we're making God first in our lives. And we got to make him first. That's so important. What do you suppose is the biggest block for people in entering into prayer or continuing once they make that commitment? Well, two things. One is boredom. A lot of children find prayer boring. You know, when I was a kid, I, I was bored by prayer. I, I was. But what convinced me was the sisters in the school where I went 
teachers of charity, they said that we should fulfill the request at Fatima. And if you want world peace, you, you better do your part and start praying the rosary. So it took me a while, but it wasn't until I was a freshman in high school, long after I had no longer been taught by the sisters, that I started to pray the rosary every day for world peace. But I thought I didn't have time for it, so I prayed it in bed. But luckily, it, it used to take me 15, 20 minutes, maybe more, to fall asleep. So I was able to pray the rosary just about every night when I was uh, starting out. But as I got older, I realized that I had to keep praying a little bit more every year. But if we grow too fast, we're going to fall back. So what that's the first thing, is to realize that it's not as boring if we keep at it. It's like anything else. When I was on the track team, I didn't get to do any high jumping for the first two months. All we did was exercises. But that was boring. But after we did the exercises, I realized I was a better high jumper. So I got to do the stuff that I was there for. So there are a lot of things that are boring at first. School is boring at first. But we don't, if we don't go to school, we're going to have a trouble in our lives. We're not going to be able to get a decent job and so on and so forth. So we have to realize that some of the most boring things that we do are some of the most important. And as we get into prayer, we realize what it's doing for us. And I realized when I was a junior in high school, hey, this is changing me. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep going for the rest of my life. Uh, but every year I try to do a little bit more with the Lord and to get close to Him. So we have to get through that. And the other thing is we think we're too busy. Well, John Paul II said, if you think you're too busy, you're not failing in, in time. You're not lacking in time. You're lacking in love. So if we're going to love somebody, we're going to spend time with them, even if it's difficult to spend time with them. So I think of the married couple where one takes care of the other for many, many years. That's love. Love, we have to realize, is something we do, not something we feel. Biblical love is giving of self for the good of the beloved without conditions. And that's the way we're supposed to love our neighbor. That's the way we're supposed to love everybody. Well, when we talk about love, we think of the great sacrifice our Lord has made to be able to bring his very essence, his, his self, his presence to us in the sacraments. If you want to grow in the spiritual life, you want to become like those saints, that is something that we really need to partake in, isn't it, Father? Absolutely. If you're going to get close to God, you need to communicate with him. I remember one of our youth group boys, he said, Father, you're saying if I don't pray, I, I'm not going to be saved? I, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's what St. Alfonso de Mori said. He said, those who pray will be saved, and those who do not pray will be damned. Very strong language of that doctor of the church. This time of a Eucharistic revival and a great need for that, from your vantage point, Father, I mean, I don't know, maybe you've seen the Pew studies that I've seen and how mass attendance has dropped so dramatically, not just among the young, but also those, the baby boomers, so many. What do you suppose is responsible for that? The big thing in the last few years has been COVID. A lot of people got used to not going to Mass, so they haven't come back. Well, that's not a foolish just because the Mass is the hardest thing we do as Christians. It brings more grace than anything we ever could do attending Mass. And it's such a great gift from God. We, we re-offer that one unique sacrifice of Jesus dying on the cross. Nothing, nothing could ever bring us more grace than intending the Holy Sacrifice in the Mass. And we have an obligation to attend Mass at least once a week on Sunday. That's part of the Third Commandment, keep holy the Lord's Day. And the Church has given us this commandment that we are to participate in Mass at least every Sunday. Otherwise, it's a serious sin. So that's still on the books. People, I said that to someone. They said, oh, I didn't know that was still true. I said, yeah, it's still true. Truer than ever. If you love somebody, you have obligations. Somebody said, well, I don't want to think of Mass as, as an obligation and more as an act of love. And that's fine. But you got to remember that anytime you love someone, you have obligations. And uh, these are obligations of love, yes. These are things that make us happy, yes. Things that are good for you, yes. 
But if you're going to love God, you got to do something. He gives us that grace, as you just pointed out, in the Mass. He gives us that when we receive reconciliation so that we can go out with grace, with him, to be able to love and serve and to live a life of virtue. I think we've forgotten all about the virtues in some ways. Absolutely. That's our goal. And on the earth is to be those vessels of virtue. And the saints who lived the virtue, they were all happy. I I can't think of an unhappy saint. They suffered, yes, but they were all happy. Think of Francis of Assisi. Think of St. Therese of Michel, or St. Teresa of Babylon. All that she suffered, she was so happy all the time. That section on the life of virtue, and, and when you outline all that, that could have been a book in itself. I think it's one of my favorite parts. Yeah, I'd like to write, write a book on that probably someday. Oh, well, I'm going to encourage you to do that because it's a great way to start, to go straight to heaven, a practical guide for growing in holiness. But each section can be expanded upon. You encourage such great guides in the saints and additional readings and everything else. It's such a gift to us to have this work, Father. Any final thoughts? Well, yeah, we have to remember, though, that the Lord calls us to happiness. He shows us the way to happiness. But the way to happiness also involves a cross. And we can't get away from that. If you avoid the cross, you're going to have a terrible time trying to get close to God. So John Vianney prayed for the grace that he would love the cross. And he was given that grace. And he endured so many crosses, but he was so happy at the at the time when he was dying. He said, death is not hard for those who have lived on the cross. So... We need to learn to kiss our cross. And St. Teresa of Avila said, when you embrace the cross, you do not feel it. So Jesus told us, if we're going to follow him, we're going to have to carry a cross. So we may as well do it joyfully rather than complain. And isn't that the, the secret is that you don't have to go out looking for it because every uh-huh. day there's something. It's those thousand little pinpricks that even Teresa of Lisieux would teach us about. Yeah, yeah. We have to praise God. Amen. Father Morrow, it's been a delight talking to you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Chris. It's been a joy for me. With Father Thomas Morrow, we've gone inside the pages of Straight to Heaven, a practical guide for growing in holiness. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to sophiainstitute.com, the website for its publisher, Sophia Institute Press. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or wherever you download your favorite podcast. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this program has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.